Tonight, Apple buys Beats, and this time it's official. Google's new self-driving car, it's different. And internet trends say mobile, it's going to be huge. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 96 for Wednesday, May 28th, 2014. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. Well, it is official. Apple confirmed just a few hours ago it is indeed buying Beats Electronics for $3 billion. That's $2.6 billion in cash and $400 million in stock. The Beats brand will remain separate from Apple's. Apple will offer both Beats streaming music service and premium headphones, and iTunes will indeed be offered alongside Beats Music. Music executive and Beats founder Jimmy Ivine and Compton native Dr. Dre will work under Eddie Q, Apple's executive in charge of internet services. Now, if the deal is approved later this year, and it still needs to be approved, it will be Apple's biggest acquisition ever. Apple CEO Tim Cook said that Dr. Dre and Mr. Ivine will be working with Apple on the next generation of music offerings, but was vague about what exactly those would be. He also told the Financial Times that Beats Music will still be available on Android and Windows Phone after the deal closes. At an event in San Francisco today, Samsung's president and chief strategy officer, Young Son, introduced a new hardware reference design called SimBand that tracks human vital metrics and connects it to a health data platform. Its new SAMI, or SAMI, platform mixes hardware and a cloud backend for sensor data, and the company says it'll improve wearable devices and the health data that they gather now and also in the future like with sensors that would be able to test blood glucose or even what's in the air around you. The wrist-mounted band has an array of sensors on the bottom and they monitor various body activities like heart rate and oxygen levels, but could be expanded with extra hardware to track other things down the road. Last night at Recode's Code Conference, which is happening down in Southern California, Microsoft announced Skype Translate, a real-time multilingual translation beta service which would work between two video chatters and speaking different languages by adding text and audio translation after each person finished speaking. Now, currently the service is only working between English and German, and that was shown off on stage, but Microsoft says other languages are coming soon. The beta will be released earlier this year. Okay, I was holding this one for a couple of stories. Last night, also at the Code Conference, Google showed off its two-seat prototype self-driving vehicle, that has no steering wheel, no accelerator pedal, no brake pedal, no mirrors, no back seat, no glove compartment, and no stereo. But it sure is cute. The project is about changing the world for people who are not well served by transportation today. That's from Google co-founder Sergey Brin. Because of the compact and round frame of the prototype, sensor mounts, Google said that the car has basically virtually no blind spots but it has newer and better sensors that give it the ability to see what's going on up to a distance of two football fields away and full 360 degree views, which is much better than the self-driving cars that Google has been testing on the road thus far. The company also says it plans to start testing in Mountain View, California, that's where Google's headquartered later this summer, and build at least 100 prototypes over the next two years for volunteer riders as soon as the system is evaluated to be safe. Back to wearables for a minute, shall we? Also at the Code Conference, it's been quite a week for them, Intel CEO Brian Krasanich showed off a wearable tech shirt. Yep, shirt on stage. He called it a smart shirt. That's one of the few products that the company had previously talked about at CES earlier this year. Now, this shirt has sensors that's supposed to monitor your health, your heart rate, even maybe your emotion, and communicate with an app on your smartphone. The shirt contains a battery, which is not meant to be wet, so you got to take it out before you wash it and maybe not wear it at the gym either. No word on pricing or availability yet, but that's not all from Intel. The company also plans to bring a fully customizable 3D printable robot kit to market by the end of the year with a consumer version priced at $1,600. What's nice is that the hardware designs will be free online for anybody and allow, if you have a 3D printer, allow you to generate and assemble the basic parts. There'll be a kit 
that will go on sale at 21stCenturyRobot.com that includes everything you can't print, like a motor, a battery, and the processor. The consumer model runs on Intel Edison. That's a low-cost computer on a chip, although a more robust version with the Intel Core i5 processor will cost closer to $16,000. Intel says it expects consumers to be able to build custom robots using this technology for less than $1,000 within the next five years. In a moment, Wi-Fi on the moon. Yes, it's a real thing. It is happening soon. But first, I am joined by Elise Hu, who is the technology and culture reporter over at NPR. Hey, Elise. Hey there, Sarah. Great to be here. Great to have you. I almost made you talk about Beats Audio with me, but I actually think <laughs> possibly more interesting, really, for the, the future of the internet and, and how we know it is Mary Meeker's annual Internet Trends Report. Uh, she's a partner over at, uh, at Kleiner Perkins, which is a VC firm. This is something that she does once a year. It's pretty highly anticipated. And, and she had a presentation at the Recode Conference, which was 164 slides long. We don't have to go through all of those. But I, but I thought there were a few things that were pretty interesting. Uh, number one is the number of internet users in the world is growing less than 10% per year. So we're, we're in a slowdown. The number of smartphone users is growing 20% per year, but it's also slowing. However, mobile data traffic is up 81%, and that is on a tra trajectory, accelerating growth, which of course is driven in part by video but also just mobile in general. Does any of that surprise you? It actually um, it sounds a lot in line with the Pew Internet study that actually came out um, late winter, early spring, that also showed these sorts of almost exponential mobile trends. And it actually makes sense to me just because volume, right? I mean, there's not that much more room to grow when it comes to Internet adoption, but there's plenty of room to grow for mobile adoption. And one study... Um, or one sort of finding of that Pew study that's in line with Mary Meeker's report is this notion of accessibility. There were plenty of folks um, in some rural areas and parts of the world um, where they have mobile access but not desktop or traditional internet access, and they get the internet through their phones and mobile devices. So it would make sense that a lot of content producers are spending a lot more energy uh, devoting themselves to responsive design and uh, mobile content. So um, that all sounds pretty pretty um, much in line with what I've seen in other places. But the imperative then for mobile advertising um, to, to get smarter and better and to sell more of it is great. And it looks like print is still continues to sell a lot of volume, even though the time spent on print, for example, is very low. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that would be my next question. I mean, we've got some page views that are coming from mobile phones. May 2014, 25%. That's up from just 14% in May 2013. Uh, Meeker uh, referenced stat counter for those numbers. But I mean, what what do you think about the uh, uh, the... What do you think about the print part of this? I mean, we of course we have we have video, but then the the page views themselves just show. I think to your point, so many people just simply are only accessing the web on mobile. Yeah, and it, so I guess what it says is that it's a glutted market, right? There's too much. There's um, we were actually I was meeting with one of the founders of Upworthy, the viral site, a few weeks ago, and he said, you know, if you notice, all of Upworthy's content is either infographics or video, and that's for a reason because they consider text-based content to be totally glutted. There's too much of it out there. Um, it's and video is kind of where they're really investing, and I think you're seeing that with other sort of forward or socially driven content producers like BuzzFeed as well. BuzzFeed announced last week it's really sort of doubling down on video and um, ending some of its partner relationships in order to launch its new video product. Um, so that's kind of just all in line with the trend that we're seeing um, from Mary Meeker. So she's right on the money there with mobile growth. She also seems to want to calm a lot of people down that say, well, there's definitely a bubble in tech. We're getting to the point now where billion dollar acquisitions are just the norm. I mean, Instagram for a billion dollars doesn't even sound like much anymore. And people say this just can't sustain. Maker points to 2013 tech IPOs are 73% below the levels in 1999, kind of before that dot-com boom and crash. Venture money last year, 77% below the peak level back in 2000. She even says tech companies are representing about 19% of the S&P 500. That's compared to 35% in March of 2000. 
what, what, why are we seeing so many acquisitions, which often don't make a lot of sense to people at such high numbers if we're not in a bubble? Sure, there's plenty of silliness um, going on in Silicon Valley right now. I mean, you, you have uh, VCs that are investing in their local coffee company, for example. But um, I thought the numbers really put things into context um, because this is a really favorite sort of cocktail chatter topic, right? Are we in a bubble? Are we not? Um, people who argue that we're in a bubble can really never be wrong because someday, whether it's 10 years down the line, one year down the line, or 20 years down the line, they can say, well, I always predicted we were in a bubble, right? But um, 3 billion people are connected to the internet now. That's 10 times more than um, people were connected in 1999. So there's just so much more uh, capacity there to grow for these companies and the barriers to entry are so much lower. Um, so I was really pleased to see her sort of put that into context, um, just how how... Uh, different 2014 looks from 1999. Absolutely. Uh, also different at web and app users are sharing and uploading 1.8 billion photos per day. I, I mean, that's just, that's, that's a ridiculous statistic. I wonder what that means for the future of video. I mean, clearly Facebook wants WhatsApp, Facebook wants Instagram because photos are where it's at. That's what we're all sharing. Do you see that happening for video? So long as people stop sending vertical video and shooting vertical video, I'm cool with it. Like vertical <laughs> video still hasn't ended, you know? Right. Uh, <laughs> and you would think that the rise of video would help all of us remember that we see horizontally and screens are horizontal. But, exactly. Um, so the question, sorry, <laughs> to get back to the- No, it's okay. To, I just, to just pet peeve of mine as well. I imagine that, yeah, I mean, this is sort of speaking in a visual medium uh, seems to be growing, especially among um, the millennials and younger generations. Um, so often now when I'm, when I'm text messaging with folks, it's sort of speaking visually, you know, and that's, that's kind of uh, a new way to, new way to communicate and exciting. Whether, whether all of us are going to become video producers though, and, um, sort of adopters and shooters of it, I think is a wider question. Um, and that was the bet of Vine, right? That was the bet of Vine. That was the bet of Instagram video. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, it's, it's, both those platforms have become places for really selective auteurs or people who are really ex experimental and early adopters. But I'm not seeing like a mass um, swell of people going to Vine and, and using Instagram video. Are you? I, I'm I mean, maybe I'm sort of behind the trend there, but. You know, I interviewed somebody the other day who's a big Vine celebrity, and I mean, his numbers are pretty outstanding. But yeah, it <laughs> seems like it's a, it's it's not a real dime a dozen situation for that kind of thing. Right, so there's plenty of watchers of video. Are there plenty of makers? Are the same number of makers? Definitely not. Right, right. Elise Hughes, the technology and culture reporter over at NPR. Thanks so much for joining us, Elise. Thank you, guys. I enjoyed it. And so did we. And uh, let people know where they can keep up with you. All right, I blog at npr.org's blog, All Tech Considered, and you can hear me on air uh, at least weekly and follow me on Twitter at E-L-I-S-E-W-H-O, Elise Who. Excellent, thanks Elise. Thanks so much. All right, finally, how is this for convenience? For the first time, scientists have demonstrated that it's possible to beam a wireless internet signal across the 238,900 miles that separate our little Earth from the even littler moon. So in effect, they've created a Wi-Fi hotspot on the moon. The demonstration was done by researchers at NASA and MIT and means that as a future moon explorer, you can theoretically check in with potentially better speed than you do from your home network now from the moon. They measured rates of 19.44 megabits per second, download speeds from the moon at 622 megabits per second. So you're gonna watch a lot more movies up there than you're gonna be sending things. Scientists used four separate telescopes based in New Mexico to send an uplink signal from the receiver mounted on a satellite orbiting the moon, and each telescope is about six inches in diameter and fed by a laser transmitter that beams information and coded pulses of infrared light. The team will present its findings June 9th at the Clio Laser Technology Conference in California.
And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show if you like it at twit.tv slash TN2. You can also write us at TN2 at twit.tv with questions, comments, or feedback. And don't miss Tech News Today. That's our morning news program tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.